Welcome to A Word from Our Outpost with Joseph and Crystal Gruber, a podcast for Catholic disciples who are wrestling to be missionary-minded in their normal, everyday lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, our actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, that every word and work of ours may begin in thee, and by thee be happily ended. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome to A Word from Our Outpost. I am Joseph Gruber, the host of this show. I wanted to share with you something that I brought up last week in the episode about the short little prayer by St. Philip Neri, the prayer, Lord, don't trust Philip today. Beautiful prayer. Listen to that episode if you get a chance. I wanted to talk about something that I brought up briefly in that episode because I think it is really, really essential for understanding the whole process of evangelization. And so I wanted to walk through it with you today. It's possible we've done an episode on this before. That doesn't really matter because, as my wife says, repetition is the key to memory. If we want people to remember things, we'll have to repeat them. And we need to find a new way of saying the same thing to the same people if we want those people to retain the thing that we're saying. Hilarious, right? Okay, so this is this is this podcast is for Catholic missionary disciples, which means that if you're listening to this, there is this assumption, this implication that you want to be trained better as a missionary, that you're looking at this episode as an opportunity for greater formation and for greater clarity about what your mission entails. And that, my friend, is what I want to give you today. I think this is one of the most helpful things that I've ever come up with. It's language that I think will make sense. I think that when you hear this, this will make sense of what evangelization actually looks like. Are you ready? Is that enough of a hook? Are you with me? Awesome. The fact that you're still listening means that you're with me. Love it. Okay. There is a cycle of trust that is inherent in evangelization. Without this cycle of trust, nothing else really makes sense. In this cycle of trust, we have basically four main areas, four main ways of trusting. So one way of, of getting at this is that to, to really live out the, the great command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, you have to understand this process. So anyone, if they want to come to know the living God, the way that they will come to know the living God will almost always be mediated by another person. There is almost always another person who is going to mediate the grace of God into the life of someone who does not yet know God. There are some examples of people who have epiphanies, people for whom God particularly moves them, but by and large, conversion happens mediated through other people. That is how God likes to operate most of the time. He delights in his secondary causes. He is the primary agent of evangelization, and we are secondary agents. He works through us. If that's the case, that means that for evangelization to happen, the first thing that needs to happen is a real relationship between people. So by and large, the way that the gospel is going to be proclaimed is when someone who does not yet know God learns to trust someone who does know God. If that bridge of trust, if that relationship between those two people does not happen, there is no real reason for the one who does not know God to ever look into the idea of God other than, you know, the the natural longing of the human heart, the restlessness of the human heart for God. But it's not going to be instantiated. It's not going to be proclaimed unless someone is there to proclaim it. But the someone who is there to proclaim it has to be trustworthy. So between the the non-Christian and the Catholic Christian, the bridge of trust is such that well, how do we gain trust? Well, we gain trust in people by, by showing real interest in them, by loving them, by being attentive to them. How do we know if they start to trust us? Well, they will start to ask us questions, and that's good. 
And oftentimes it can be a, uh, I don't know, it, uh, the, 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 the problem of the zealot, right? The problem of the, the new convert zeal going out and just telling people things right off the bat without forming a relationship, without seeing if there's any interest. Uh, the, the problem there is that they're skipping steps. They're skipping steps in the relationship. They, they are uh, being indiscreet, right? Like discretion is this sense of uh, being attentive to the organic unfolding of a relationship and to say, I'm only going out and just going to throw seeds at people. Maybe not even seeds, maybe saplings, or even just like full-flung, full-grown oak trees at people. Um, well, that's, not, that's a, not going to work. The soil has to be prepared. And the soil is prepared by us being present and loving to other people, such that they learn to trust us. That only works if we're actually trustworthy. We'll get to that in a little bit. So if a non-Christian learns to trust someone else who is a follower of God. The follower of God, just by how they're living their life, how they're speaking uh, from day to day, becomes a signpost to the ever-living God. Actually, truth be told, every single person is a signpost pointing to God because we're made in the image and likeness of God. But those who are intentionally following God in word and in deed, have an opportunity to point to God actively, to participate in the very image that they bear, to be an active signpost, right? Like um, uh, a little bit like how Scarecrow is a living signpost at the beginning of The Wizard of Oz. That's maybe a little bit of a weird analogy. If that doesn't work for you, let it go. So we get to be a living, active signpost to say, this, you find me trustworthy. The reason you find me trustworthy is because I have been made so by this God fellow, and I would like you to get to know him. So if they trust a Christian, they might then be open to trusting God. They might try to learn how to trust God, and how do they learn to trust God is that they pepper him with questions. So they pepper a neighbor with questions when they're learning are you trustworthy? I won't even ask someone a question if I don't care about them and if I don't think they care about me. There's very little reason to, to ask questions of someone who doesn't care about me. But if someone does care about me, then I can feel safe enough to ask them questions and confident that if they don't have answers, they're not going to BS me. Same thing with God. I can start asking him questions and testing him, and and finding out what people really mean about this God fellow. Start talking to him myself. Start reading. This is the this is the area the, the zone in evangelization when people tend to consume a lot more in terms of content. So they'll be listening to podcasts and audio books and reading books and uh, participating in online forums and uh, being active in discussion groups and the like. Because they're trying to say, okay, if this God fellow is real, then I need to learn, is he somebody that is worth trusting? Sometimes people mistake this, this area of questioning because it's so active and so zealous and so um, intense for some people. They might think, oh, they, they're already a Christian. They're already zealous because they are following Christ. It's like, well, no, they're, they're not there yet. They're, they're still testing. And so... Let's not jump ahead of ourselves. There's a tendency always and ever to jump from one stage to the next instead of allowing the organic unfolding to happen. I think it's a really bad idea to jump without letting the organic unfolding and happen. Un unfolding happen. I think that when that happens, that what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up for uh, disappointment and other people up for confusion and uh, disillusionment. So, let's say someone decides this God fellow is trustworthy. They make a commitment to Christ. This is instantiated usually through baptism, through this public declaration that, yes, I believe all that the church teaches, and I believe that the church is a truth-teaching body. 
that commitment to God and to his church, his bride, is a great thing. And now the twist is, in the becoming of Christian, uh, becoming Christian, the the questioning that was of neighbor and of God is now turned to self. The self is now becoming uh, someone who is being refashioned as someone who might be more trustworthy. So to even more assiduously root out sin, to more assiduously practice virtue, to gain habits, to to study. To, to work on the perfecting of the intellect and the will and the training of the passions that our hearts, our minds, our, our whole being be in alignment with, with the decision that we've made. This is the great work of this phase. So first, uh, we, we test the trustworthiness of a neighbor. Then we tr- test the trustworthiness of God. And then, if... If, if we're really actually attentive to this pathway of discipleship, of evangelization, hopefully there are people in our lives who are saying, here, here is the way of, of the Christian life. It is a hard way, but it is the way. This is the way of joy. This is the way of peace. This is the way of clarity. This is the way of uh, true charity. And so it's worthwhile to, to spend time in this zone. Uh, Diedrich von Hildebrandt talks about with the new convert, that uh, one of the ways in which they are, are indiscreet is that they go out and start evangelizing willy-nilly without this period of, of application to, to oneself, of deep reflection for oneself. And having worked for a missionary organization that oftentimes hired new converts, I, I get it. I, I get, one, the attractiveness of hiring somebody who is really zealous for the Lord, um, but I think I'm learning to appreciate more and more Diedrich von Hildebrandt's uh, patience in the urgency of saying, yes, it is a good thing that you have converted. It is good that you have all this energy. This energy, first and foremost, must be turned to self. And there must be a time of quiet for the self to really grow in the way that they're called to grow. This is why religious orders, this is why seminary seminaries won't accept new converts until they've been living the Christian life for at least a couple of years. We, I know in, in the organization that I used to work for, uh, usually some number of hires that we had were the new converts who really wanted to join a religious order or enter the seminary, and they were told, you have to live the Christian life first. And so they went to, to focus, uh, which incidentally is really good training for living the Christian life. So I think Maybe it is probably an okay thing that Focus does hire the new converts for their sake. Okay, that next phase of becoming trustworthy ourselves is the the next phase of evangelization, the, the, the application to the individual who has been evangelized, uh, the unpacking of the graces of the sacraments. This is the mystagogy phase where we, we're saying, okay, on Easter Vigil, you receive these sacraments, or whenever you entered the church, you receive these sacraments. Let's give you time to unpack what this means, to, to uh, enter more deeply into the mystery into which you've been initiated. And from that place, it is from that place that we can then move from becoming trustworthy to learning how to entrust ourselves to our neighbors. What do I mean by that? I mean that we are all called to mission. If you are a Catholic layperson, you are called to sanctify the temporal order through how you live, through how you work, through how you speak. And that does mean learning to love those who are not yet in union with our Lord such that they learn how to trust you so that they might be pointed to Christ, that they might become the Christian that they are called to be. And that process, that process of entrusting, is also a kind of, uh, well, it's, uh, it, it's learning how to be truly present to the other, how to listen, how to ask good questions, how to share with them as appropriate uh, when they ask, and how to, to live a life that prompts questions. We, we ought to live a life where people look at us and say, how is it that you're doing what you're doing? and you are joyful. How can you be living this way 
with a smile on your face? How can you be enduring this and still be singing? That is what we want. We, we want to live a life that invites questions, a life where people say, whatever it is you have, I want to know more about it. Whatever it is you're doing, I want to be around it. That's the kind of life we want to live. We want to live an attractive life and a life that we are constantly giving away. The apostolate is the overflow of the interior life, which means that if we don't have an interior life, there is no apostolate. There is um, some weird approximation of an apostolate, but it's not the apostolate. It's not the overflow of the interior life. So if we're not praying, if we don't have habits of prayer, if we're not entrusting ourselves to God on the daily, and if we're not learning how to become trustworthy ourselves, there is no apostolate. There is no sharing of the gospel, at least in any way that does us any good. God can work uh, wonders through us even when we're not willing to participate. That's one of the crazy things about the role of Satan in the world is that even in his disobedience, he is still serving God. He is still uh, part of the, the plan of God, even unwillingly. How much better it is to be a, participate, a participant in the plan of God willingly. How much better it is to be a willing participant in the plan of God. And the way to do that is to have a life in which we have learned to trust other people in which we've been able to have conflict with them, in which we've been able to share things that are hard and they've been able to share hard things with us in a way where they have been able to point to Christ for us through their words and through their deeds, where we then have wrestled with God and asked for his blessing and submitted to his blessing such that we live a blessed life, that we might share that blessed life not only with him, but with everyone we meet. This is the Christian life. This is, this is what the Christian life is about. This is what evangelization is about. Sometimes the word evangelization, it gets a, a weird kind of uh, proselytizing sort of vibe from people. Uh, that's because there hasn't been real trust built. We don't build trust through uh, a mechanism. We don't build trust as a scheme to get people. We don't build trust as a means to an end. We build trust with people because we desire their good, even if they, they never want to, to follow God, even if they never ask about God. We want to give our lives away to them because there was a time, and there may be many times in our lives, when God gives himself to us and we are not receptive. And in light of that, to, to make a few invitations now and again to, to someone who is maybe far from our Lord is not that big of a deal. If people say no to, to God now because we've given them an option, because we've witnessed to them in word and deed a joyful life, we can pray that that's not their final answer but we also get to respect whatever answer they have. We get to love them in whatever answer that they have. And we get to, to still display a love for them. I think many times, because trust hasn't really been built, evangelization gets a really bad rap. When we rush through these different stages and we try to check off these different stages as if it's a checklist, a to-do list, uh, this must be done list. Then we're going to damage people. Most importantly, we're damaging ourselves when we do that. When we, when we're not respecting the natural order of things, the the development of real relationships, we're just doing ourselves a disservice. We are becoming less human ourselves. And if we're becoming less human, we can't really witness the joy of Christ. Christ is the humanist of all. He is also the divine person. In his sacred humanity, he is the most human of all. And when we decide to skip steps, when we decide to uh, 
not be attentive to the person and where they are right now, what we're saying is, Lord, you have established an order in this world. You have established a way for relationships to develop. And I found a better way. I found a quicker way. I'm more efficient. I have a system. I have this down to a science. And it will play out the way that it has to play out. And I will rack up the numbers so that I'll get that free toaster in heaven. You know, I'll get my punch card, uh, you know, 10 punches, and I'll get a free free coffee. This is the American way, and it is not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is through real abandonment to the will of the Father. It is real dedication to the good life, and it is real entrusting. This is the craziest thing about the Last Supper, is that Christ entrusts himself to Judas, who hands him over. Right, the, the goal, the whole goal of the Christian life is to receive Christ so well that we can hand him to other people, to, to be part of this living tradition of faith. And Christ knew that this is something that can be abused, and he knew that Judas could take Christ and hand him over to the chief priests and the scribes and the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and Herod and Pilate, and he could hand them over, hand him over to, to these people. And what he would be handing over is not the fullness of Christ. He, he would hand over their misconceptions of Christ. He would feed into their misconceptions of Christ. He would play off their misconceptions of Christ because he was, well, I mean, we don't have all of the answers for why he did what he did. We know that he received silver for it. We know that he returned the silver for it. Whatever the reason is, it was insufficient. The way in which Judas gave over Christ that led to the passion of our Lord and his death and his resurrection, contrast that to how Peter hands on Christ. Peter offers Christ to the people on Pentecost in a way where they know exactly who he is and they get a chance to make a response to him. And, and what was it, 3,000 were added to their number that day? Which, when you realize that they're there for Pentecost, which is a Jewish holiday, and that there were probably, you know, like, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people there for it, um, in addition to all the people who lived in Jerusalem at the time, um, maybe 3,000 doesn't seem like as much. It's still a lot, though. And I mean, I haven't had a day in which 3,000 people gave their lives over to Christ just because I preached, so... Don't, I don't have room to talk. I get that. I get I get it. Um, but, but he's handing over Christ as he really is. And he knows that because he's lived life with Christ, and he's also repented of his sins and his, his, uh, his own betrayal of our Lord, his own denial of our Lord. And that is part of becoming trustworthy, is to repent and to say to our Lord, you are God, and I am not. That's evangelization in a nutshell. I may include a little uh, link to a PDF of this cycle of discipleship, of this cycle of trust, uh, because it's, it's, it's an easy thing to sketch out. It's a dynamic between God and neighbor, right? Like, first, neighbor has to trust neighbor. Neighbor points to God. God directs us to back to ourself. Self learns how to give oneself to the neighbor, and then on and on and on. This is the cycle of the Christian life. This is what mothers and fathers need to do with their children. If the children do not trust their parents, there is no way in which the faith will be passed on through the parents. If the children do not trust the parents, there is no way that the faith will be passed on through the parents. They may still hold on to the faith, but it will be in spite of their parents if their parents are not trustworthy. And so, whether we're talking about generational passing on of faith, or if we're talking about from one peer to another, we, we're called to live lives beyond reproach. We're called to live trustworthy lives. You are capable of such a life. You are capable of leaving behind 
all the things that are unbecoming of you. You are capable of living a more dignified, beautiful life. You are capable of the kind of joy that Christ has in store for you. You are capable of the good life. And God wants you to have the good life for your own sake and for the sake of everyone around you. He loves you and he loves all the people around you. He wants to love the people around you through you. He wants you to be able to receive the grace you need in order to love the people that he has given you. My wife has this pet theory that uh, sometimes it feels like we're actually trying to do the work of four or five people. Uh, And maybe we are trying to do the work of four or five people right now. And she has this theory that that means that there are people in this world who are saying no to the grace of their vocation, the, the grace to do the work that is before them, and that we might be called to step in. And so she has recently taken to asking for the graces that other people are saying no to, that she might be able to do their work and that she might be able to love them in such a way that maybe, just maybe, they will say yes to the grace that God has in store for them, that they can carry out the work that he has for them, that he might give them the grace that they need so that they can partake in the plan of God, which is a plan that is joyful both for them and for all those that they love. I don't know about this pet theory. I, I don't know how how you you uh, enumerate graces. I, I, don't, I don't personally get that. I only have a master's in theology. My wife is just you know, well on her way to sainthood. So she she probably gets this a lot better than I do. All that to say, there there is something to this, I think, that there are graces for other people that we are called to receive on their behalf, that they might know the love of God through us. That that can be our prayer, that we might be the living gospel for other people so that they can come to trust us and through us come to trust Christ. And through trusting Christ, they might live the lives they are called to live. And then they might become, alongside us, secondary agents of evangelization, working with the Holy Spirit, who is the primary agent of evangelization. That's the goal of all of this. Real transformation is possible, both for us and everyone that we know. If they're breathing transformation is still possible. Their hearts are not done. They might expand more. They might contract more. We don't know. We only know that we can invite people to open their hearts, to let us in, and then to let the Lord in. That their heart might be made beautiful, shining, radiant, and that it might be a lamp to all those who are still in darkness. That's the name of the game, ladies and gentlemen. That's the missionary life in a nutshell. That's this whole path. When someone's talking about evangelization, they're talking about either the love of neighbor that is so good and pure that it leads people to God, that they might love him so that they might become the man or woman they're called to be, so that they might share the good news with others. That is the whole path of evangelization. That, that, that comprehends the Christian life. That makes sense of what we're here to do. We're here to love so well because we have been loved so well. If you find yourself in a place where you're like, I don't think anyone has really loved me in this way. I don't think anyone has ever really reached out to me in this way. I don't think anyone has modeled Christian charity to me in this way. You know, the, the Mahatma Gandhi quote, I would become a Christian if I, ever, ever, if I had ever met one. If that's you and you're listening to this podcast, I don't know, send me an email. I'll give you a call. I'll talk with you. I will share with you all of the good news that I have to share. So send me an email. I'd be happy to to talk sometime. Speaking of which, if you're a Catholic husband, I would be especially happy to talk with you. There will be a link in the show notes for uh, a way to sign up if you're a Catholic husband because we run a marriage ministry because we want to awaken authentic Catholic culture through holy matrimony, because we want to help husbands and wives become more competent and confident at running beautiful evangelical homes. All of that is why we're here. We have another podcast called Love Your Marriage. That one you can find. I'll put a link in the show notes for that. We have some events coming up. There will be a link to that in the show notes as well. 
you can reach out to us at hello at our outpost.org. And finally, if you're listening this long, if you've listened to this whole episode, would you do me a favor and make sure if you have not yet rated and reviewed this podcast, please do so. If you have not shared this podcast with anyone, please share this podcast with someone. If you have found it worthwhile, you probably know someone else who might think this is worthwhile. Even if you just find us on Facebook or Instagram and share whatever it is we've posted for the week, uh, usually we just post about this podcast and our other podcast, but you can feel free to share those as well. I thank you for doing that. I, I know some people have been doing that uh, regularly, and I know some people have rated and reviewed our show, and I want to say my thanks to you. I really do appreciate it. It means a lot, um, especially if I don't know you. It means all the more to, to hear from you how we're doing and if this is doing you any good. I pray that it is. I will be praying for you. Please pray for me. Please pray for my family. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Take my hand and let's be on our way And now, finally, I can say that I love you Yes, I love you from our outpost to yours. Thanks for listening. And a special thanks to John Mark Skoke. That's S-K-O-C-H. For the music. Check him out on Spotify. 